So I'd like to give a warm welcome and a round of applause for Josh Fulmer. Yeah, hi, thanks all for having me. Uh, this is my short film, The Postman. I made it about three years ago now, so it was when I was at my last year of college. So this is what I submitted for my final major project. Uh, it was supposed to be about 15 minutes long. Uh, I know it's not that anymore, so I hope you guys enjoy. And uh, yeah, thank you. Someone ran over my daughter and just drove away. <laughs> They smashed their car into my life and just drove away. All I need now is some justice for my daughter, my little girl. Trauma is a tough thing to beat. It can affect your judgment. It can cloud your every decision. And it can turn you into someone you're not. Never piss off a postman. They know where you live. Yeah, so that was my film, The Postman. Thank you guys all for watching. Um, yeah, I made that for my grad film, as I said, uh, my final major project when I was in college. And uh, that was about three years ago now. And through this film, it still benefited me today. I'm now studying at Bournemouth University. Um, I'm about to go through my final term and approach my grad project. Uh, I've always had a huge amount of love for filmmaking, and I'm so happy that I I'm still pursuing it today. I've had the chance to network with so many incredible people and produce stories that I've been dying to tell. I first got involved with Sabali through Elliot Wood and Alfie Nugent. I met them both at a Saturday performing arts class called Pauline Quirks Academy, where uh, Elliot taught film. Uh, after Elliot left the academy, however, he approached a couple of us to see if we would still be interested in continuing uh, or any role in filmmaking. Uh, but because I didn't check my voicemail, unfortunately, I missed this call. Uh, it wouldn't be until I was 17 in 2020 when Alfie told me Sabali was looking for an editor with a number of comedy uh, sketch adverts and school tours. Uh, that would first come aboard with the company. And I don't know what you guys were up to in 2020, but I wasn't doing much, so of course I agreed. Uh, I instantly fell in love, uh, I instantly fell at home amongst like-minded creative people. I started going to set to operate Boom, so I could get more involved and familiar with how a set operates. The first film I did with the company was called Tractor Run, which will hopefully come out this year, Elliot. Um, after the production, Elliot brought me on to be the first assistant cameraman on the company's first feature film, Roast Pork. Another two years on that one, at least. Yeah, About that. <laughs> However, during the production, I worked my way up to assistant director and then eventually to second unit director on the project, which would uh, mean entrusting me to direct some of the smaller segments of the film so co-directors Elliot and Dan Hayward could focus on other scenes. During the filming, I was working on other projects of my own and used up Ali's resources to help benefit my own produ productions. This led nicely to my final major project, The Postman, as I finished college. For me, The Postman is a very personal film and came at a very strange time in my life. I wasn't too sure what my next step after college would be and felt fairly stagnant in what I was supposed to do next. All I knew was I wanted to make movies. I used to hear this comment a lot at college, being, we haven't been asked to make anything yet. And I never quite understood what anyone meant by that. If it's your passion, you should be doing it anyways. I didn't make The Postman because it was my grad. I was making The Postman and it just so happened to align with the dates that I needed to submit it by. It's been three years now, as I said, since I've made that, and it's still benefiting me today. This, this film allowed me to get a scholarship and spent the past few years studying film at Bournemouth University, where I've met so many like-minded creative people with the same drive and enthusiasm I have for this incredible form of storytelling. In this time, I've learned so much on set being with Sabali, and I'm delighted to now be co-running it with the other four heads of the company. We have so many projects in the works right now, and I cannot wait to work on. Right now, we're just about to launch our crowdfunding campaign for our next project called EMOT, which I will be submitting as my grad film to finish uni. So I guess the main statement I want to leave you guys with this is don't wait for people to tell you when to start making the things you want to make. Don't wait for someone to give you a shot. Use the resources you have around you and at your disposal and build your own career up because no one is stopping you. If it's your passion, you should be doing it anyways. So yeah, now um, we're going to show a little behind the scenes, just a little 10 minutes, I promise it won't be another 40 minute film, and uh, just a bit of the behind the scenes and the making of it, and then I'll open the floor to you guys to ask me any questions you want to ask. These are a few of my least favourite. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
Films were like this. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, definitely Taxi Driver because at the end it was kind of like I like it, it's like a breakdown of a man he loses so much and then by the end he just kind of goes ape shit <laughs> at the end so um, yeah Taxi Driver was a big inspiration Nightcrawler uh, Jake Gyllenhaal um, I just was at the time I was fascinated just studying a guy and seeing how insane they can get and uh, just kind of it gives you a chance to really express anything that you want to put into the page yeah the car crash scene. Okay, so um, with great difficulty. Um, it was my little sister actually got really scared that day and um, she just didn't want to do this scene. She didn't understand that we would film the car separately, like the car wouldn't actually be hitting her, which was like took quite a while to explain to her. But um, basically what we did is we filmed Kristen uh, in the road and she just had to like just kind of react. And then we then filmed the car just driving past and we, all we did, we had to, we just masked it but it obviously cuts right before to black and the screen is literally just in half and Kristen is literally just doing that and the car is just going there and just before it hits her, we just cut to black. Um, I, honestly, that scene now, like it's really, I was saying this to Elliot, obviously it's quite easy to be critical of your work, especially like three years on. And um, at the time, you know, I was, I was, I think I made this when I was 17, 18 that kind of age, and there's, I was working with the resources I had around me, and I think it was, you know, it's very easy to kind of be like, oh, I wish I'd done that bit differently, or I wish I'd had another scene maybe with uh, Dan and Nick where they were, you know, bonding a bit more, maybe a bit more time passed, or, uh, yeah, and just obviously there's stuff that happens on set, especially like a lot of student films, everyone's learning, and uh, yeah, I remember that scene particularly when they do hit, the tri I don't know how, but the tripod moves, so when syncing it up, it has to be exactly straight, exactly stationary, because the slightest movement you're going to see. So if you do watch the scene again, you'll see on the left, just the camera tilts up a little bit. And every time I watch it, I will just kind of cringe, because I see it, her like kind of start to rise before the, uh, the car hits her. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it was mentioned that you filmed it sort of out of order. Is there, what was your main reason behind it? It's so many different reasons, really, when it comes to, that's more to do, to do with your shooting schedule than actually wanting to film out of order. Um, you know, certain occasions on certain days. Time of day as well, that's a big one. So say if like the end bit there, you know when uh, Felix started to um, turn at the end, we had to make sure we did that in the evening shots. But obviously we're doing it in about four different locations, just that scene of him getting from there to there. So we could be filming the first scene, gets to the end of the day, and we're like, oh, we need to get him leaving the house at the end of the day. Great, we'll get that now and then we just kind of stitch it together. So, yeah, and also just actors' availability. Um, and yeah, I always had a backup day though, because um, initially, like I said, I was filming that scene where they're walking and talking. I was filming that on like day three, and I, moved, I had a backup day for day five, which I didn't need, but I made sure everyone was free that day, just so anything I didn't get, I could be like, it's okay, we can get it this day. Um, which is always really good, because it's important to be able to have that freedom, say if something's not working, be able to take a step back, figure it out and then come back to it. So it was all filmed in five days? Filmed in five days, it was over two weekends. So it was like a two, two day weekend and then like three days, so like uh, Saturday to Monday. So uh, yeah, it was a busy couple of weeks. How long did like the makeup take? Have you seen where they poured like the water on the people? Yeah. How long was that? God, um, that honestly was the reason why it was such a long day that day. That day was actually a 20 hour day, which was just mental. Cause it wasn't meant to be 20 hours. But um, 
basically, I think that, that took about two to three hours at least, just sitting there, just in makeup. And we were all just waiting around trying to get all the pickup shots. So like, we got the shots of him, like his hands behind his back, like struggling. Um, like, I don't think that, was, that, that wasn't his hands, I think they were my hands. Um, just getting all these different pickup shots, because you won't notice that. And uh, yeah, so it took a few hours, especially because the makeup continuity was really important as well. Uh, Jasmine, the makeup artist, she always gets a bit annoyed watching it because there's a segment that I cut out because it just didn't look too good. And it was just long it out. It was this bit where we got some glass from the photo and he just started stabbing his face and then made him eat it. And it was this whole, like, it was gruesome and it was fun on the day, but it was, there's, there's, if you look carefully, you can see a couple of hits where the makeup hit. Um, and also it's, it's the build up. We didn't go straight to that. Obviously we started off with just his leg and then we went to, you know, always oh, burnt the side of his, his cheek and then just keep building and building it up until at the end it's just, especially for like full body as well. Face, that, that doesn't take as long, but to get like from head to like your waist, that's gonna take at least a few hours, depending on what you're trying to do, yeah. There you go. Uh, how was the flashbacks um, after Elliot gets hit? After Elliot gets hit? Uh, we did that practically, completely practically. <laughs> Honestly, that, that was honestly just a free special effect uh, on YouTube. So usually you can download all these special effects just in, off YouTube. Just go into um, like a YouTube MP4 converter and just look for like non-copyright sounds or you could do Foley. So a lot of the stabbing we did Foley, like I got a watermelon and just stabbed the watermelon about 80 times at different places until I got all the, the sounds I wanted. I also got like some like chicken and we like hit it with like rolling pins and stuff like that just to get all the hits in. Um, some, some of the hits as well, there was like a stapler at one point um, we just we just got a little bit you know, had a bit of fun with it really and just uh, experimented with loads of different uh, foley sounds which I think is one of the most fun things actually in post production uh, to be able to just get all this uh, like like when you do baking for rain for example it just sounds really cool but yeah yeah. What was your advice be on sort of reaching out for um, people or your work being recognised by the right people? Networking um, I think. Honestly, it's, it's, you're building your own portfolio. That's, that's the biggest thing. You're selling, because you might as well, you could be the best writer you know, of all time, but they don't know that. And if you need to show that through your work, and nobody goes, oh, hey, Josh, how you doing? It's, it's oh, you did the postman. And that's, that's, that's me to them when networking. Your project, your portfolio, that's who you're representing. So try and just use the resources you've got at your disposal and just build up your portfolio as much as possible. And in terms of picking the right people, I mean, you're here now in college, there's loads of people in the same boat as you. Getting a LinkedIn profile as well, that's honestly, I'd say, one of the other biggest things. That's how you get a lot of paid work, mostly corporate stuff. But again, you're finding people to collab with. Um, Star Now, I know we got a lot of our like, uh, makeup artists and actors from Star Now. Yeah, yeah. So how I, was, well, how I networked for The Postman was because I'd already met Elliot. When I was on set, I asked around if they were free on these filming dates. Like, are you available to do it? Don't be too shy to ask people for favours and be like, can you do this? If, even if you don't have any money, they might leap on it because they want something for their portfolio too. Or they might just really like the script. So I think networking like that, I think that's the biggest thing. And just get an online presence. Get a website, get a YouTube channel, an Instagram page, just a LinkedIn. Just market yourself as much as possible because that way, that's how people remember you. When you exchange details, even if you have like a little card, just have all of your your details there, it's your whole portfolio from start to finish, and that shows what you're worth, really, and why they want to work with you as much as you would want to work with them. Just to sort of interrupt you, Daniel, just to kind of maybe go into a little more detail on the back of what you're saying, the reason why me and George now work together is because you guys all know Alfie Nugent, is that right? So he was one of George's friends. Alfie was doing starting one of my films. He recommended Josh, so we had a chat, we had an interview, he came on set, he said, we're going to do audio today, do a good job, we'll bring you on more projects, and here we are three years later. So. It, was, it, was, it was a school tour, wasn't it, as well? Because um, during lockdown, people couldn't go and visit schools. You had to record um, yeah. what the school was like. And uh, you, was it you and Jake? Yeah. So yeah, you and, yeah. Before, they helped with a little job I was doing for the school I've worked at currently. And then, going on to the next project, as you said, now he's um, co-directing with me. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I, I was just editing that uh, school tour. And then I remember you came over and you told me about the uh, sketch comedy adverts. Yeah. And um, I said, oh, I'd love to edit those as well, but could I come on set and maybe just, I can just hold the boom at least, so that way I can just kind of meet, the, meet everyone there, talk to like-minded people, and then we just, you know, grow a relationship over time. And uh, yeah. It's really, really important, guys. The portfolio thing is incredibly important, but also that networking is really, really important. 
and no one in the world will ever be upset if you ask to do more. Hence why Josh saying, I want to come on set, and I come on set. Like, no one in their right mind is going to go, no, that's really bad, you shouldn't say that. If you're ever talking to someone in the industry, ask them that question, because you might get a yes, and that's how then you might build a relationship. It's through just asking, can I come see you on set? Can I shadow you? Can I come help out? Can I do anything like that? Yeah? There's nothing wrong with asking. Demanding is different, but there's nothing wrong with asking. <laughs> Anyone else got any other questions? There are a couple of people who have had Yeah. Um, how did you create the balloon setting? Sorry, I can't... How, how did I create what, sorry? Created the balloon setting. Um, yeah, a lot of, so obviously imposed a lot of colour grading. Um, uh, my gaffer was really good as well. He just, we just, every, every scene we did, we discussed the tone of the scene I was going for. So is this a happy moment in Felix's life? Is this a tough moment in Felix's life? Where is he? And, um, so like at the start, we've got more, more yellows and like orangey colours. And then after, obviously, uh, Annabelle dies, it gets a bit greyer. And we just kind of go into this darkness. And then when Felix starts kind of finding a bit of a lifeline with Dan, we pick it up a bit. We make it a bit brighter again. And then I think the clearest one was when he first goes into the car, uh, wait, waiting for the car, but when he realises uh, uh, Ethan's character has the car that killed his daughter, it's a lot brighter. And then when we get out, it's suddenly a lot greyer. And I think that's the clearest like differential difference there. But yeah, mostly colour grading. Was this through filming or through editing that like the movie feel? Um pre-production really. It, it's it's honestly like when writing each scene what we're going for with your DOP and just kind of going, what's the tone of this? What where are we? Where where is where's Na where's Nathan at? Not Nathan, uh, Felix at. And um yeah, so that, that goes way before you even start recording. And then, because if you do it in post, you can do it in post. It ca you have the issue of it could look tackier because you may film it like it's really bright. I remember one time you brought me in for something and these people were trying to make like night, uh, day into night and it's so hard to do. Or if they make it really, really dark. It was, um, I think it was, you remember when I did those uh, youth group uh, advert with Sam? Yeah, you were teaching some people some Premiere Pro stuff and it was, it's just a ball, like, you've got to know beforehand, because uh, it's just going to look tackier uh, if you don't do it beforehand. But yeah. Yeah. How did you like the torture scene? How did I like the torture scene? Um, we were using, well, the red light we shone through, we had this kind of like double glass window. We were using like a lot of Amaran's uh, 200Xs. Um, that, yeah, just, just massive lights like that shone through the glass. Uh, I think my biggest issue with the torture scene, what I would have done differently next time was have a source for your light. So maybe he parked a car outside and then it's the red light, that's how we get the red light. But um, in this case, I just kind of wanted the red light because there was a red light. But it's stuff you learn, like you look back on and you go, oh, it would be really cool to have a source for that light. By saying, oh yeah, he parked the car, that's why there's a red light outside or something like that. Yep. The shot of Elliot getting punched, could we possibly get that? We can reenact it. <laughs> 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 um, I just wanted to ask about your university somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, I go to Bournemouth University, um, and it's probably, honestly, I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to do anything in filmmaking. Uh, I love it. I've been there for the last three years. It's honestly the best thing, best decision I think I've ever made, and it's all because of the postman. Um, at uni, it's, you're, you're with people there because they're, they're, everyone there has more of a passion than I ever had found at college. Like, a lot of people at college, when I was at college, was uh, kind of just there to do, do, maybe you do an easy course. But when you go to uh, university, everyone's there. They're, they're taking a lot of time. It's money to get a loan. Everyone's like moved out there to do this. So they're a lot more passionate. And it's a lot more competitive, I'd say. But that's kind of what you want. You want to kind of be test, be pushed to make a better film, uh, make better projects. And yeah, honestly, I'd recommend anyone to go to university because it's the best step to do. And it's the best place for networking as well. You're going to find so many people just like wanting to constantly make projects. And again, half, most of the films I make, they're nothing to do with the syllabus. They're not because we have to do it for this grade or we have to do it for this project. We're just making it because we want to build up a body of work. And also, we just want to tell stories. We really like making the, the final product. I think that, that's what I like most about filmmaking is having something to show for my work. And yeah, and just be proud of it. I don't know if this question has been asked or if it's only just entered. <laughs> what my big thing is going to be, what do you think is going to be one of the biggest pitfalls in the film made? Causes the most holdups, causes the most issues that potentially could be. I think. Um, 
I think um, a lot of people, they, they have an idea of a project, and they really over ambitious and they make it like, oh, what, I want to have like, they have a car chase, and we can have like this plane comes out. And that's great in the writing stage. I always encourage just, you write, you don't have a budget in the writing stage, and then compromise with the best people, and find the story trying to make I feel like a lot of people, they think they're going to be the next school, right? but you're not going to be the next school, you're going to be the next year. You've got to write your own story. And you've got lots of like a mimic other people's work. Take from it, of course. But I find a lot of people go, oh, I saw this movie, I'm just going to make this movie again, but the nice thing is my children's more important. It's like, it's, it's, that's very cool, but good, but finding your own vision, finding your own creative voice, that's the most important thing. That's what you should focus on. All the fun action stuff, that can come later. Like, you, you, you can always get to that. I think if you've got a good story, that will overshine any amount of equipment, any amount of talent you have on set. Like, if you film a, a good film in the worst quality, there's still be a great film. You film a horrible film investment, but I'd much rather see the one that's better written. And so, yeah, mainly looking for the best scripts, I'd say. And um, yeah. I actually have a question for you, Josh. Um, yeah. Not a question, actually. There's one thing actually that I don't think anyone's mentioned at all, which is actually so important, is actors. And you guys know my hatred to watch actors, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, Josh, give us some tips and tricks. Well, how did you find sort of working with? I, I guess, to your credit, these professional actors in the industry who aren't a bit on university and actually working all the time. So, what was it like working with actors? Yeah, so when I first uh, got into filmmaking, my first that I wanted to do was acting. So that's how I got that's how I went it really was because I went to the university and I didn't like to be doing the best and a lot of different kind of stuff. Um, and I realized I wasn't making it. So um, I wanted to do tell stories rather than tell other people's stories. Um, so I've always had that come back to brain though why I didn't do that and when I did that. I always perform what I say and say it until I wanted to say it. Um, in terms of like different episodes, yeah, I was really fortunate to have and it's very much just like, do you take it, do you reverse it, do you always go to set and go, right, yeah, and actually you know the lines, don't just make them learn lines, learn how you learn. Only the right spot, the same lines in a certain tone, the same in a certain manner. They don't know that. They don't know how they want it. Obviously, that you can learn in school at the time. Do the table. They could be sitting in bed just reading about that. Uh, right, yeah, I know. Like, the next day they're coming to set. And it's, it's just they're just saying because they're remembering the lines, what they're acting lines. And also, it should never feel like the line anyway. Right? So it should be like a natural for the character to say that. If an actor is like stumbling on the line to try to say it, that doesn't that happen. If that's what they feel natural, make them the character. I mean, that's the most important thing as well. Um, don't be afraid to let them go off the script. Um, because you're hiring an actor and they should know more about acting than you and, and you're collabing together to make the performance. Yeah. So how did you find the actors? How did I find the actors? Um, yes, as I said, uh, I found them through Sabali in this case, for the postman. Uh, Star Now was where you found most of them? I found them through, uh, well, I found them initially through Mandy Actors, um, which I do recommend to you, by the way, because Star Now, because it's got the word star in it, is it anyone who thinks they can act? Man the actors and man the crew, a lot more you know, freelance and not all the professionals. Um, I would really recommend that like, if you are a big you know, free man the crew account, mm. you can sign up, you can basically put any job advertisements out on there. I think I mean we've done them in the past, but I think we only mainly use man the actors. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's worth it. Also, again, there, there are jobs out there. You, you can pay the three pounds a month for man the crew, you can literally apply. Yeah, there's, lo there's, lo there's loads of acting agencies. I mean, I've just done them. Um, Literally just last week finished on a casting directing um, for this film called A Trip Down Memory Lane. And uh, we've just been doing this month of just casting and auditioning. Um, don't just go with the first person you see. Make them send an audition tape. Make them see how they say the lines simply. Make them sh see your showreel. Um, in terms of that's in terms more so the process of hiring an actor. But uh, yeah, there's agencies everywhere. And um, also there could be people right here in this. I don't know if anyone wants to be an actor in this room, but um, there's loads of people around who want to do performing arts who think could be really good for the role. Uh, but mainly, yeah, just look for some agencies because it's all online. Yep. How did you network like, 
a makeup artist because I am not <laughs> Yeah, so I've known a few makeup artists through the years, mainly because of, again, college. There was a makeup department in my college. Um, and then the first makeup artist I met was, uh, I think, was it Charlie? Yeah, Charlie? yeah, and Tractor Run. So honestly, just going up to them, because they're going to be doing makeup for hours on set. So go over to them, have a little chat, pitch a project to them if they, if they want to do it. Um, yeah, again, again, put out an ad, put out a search, put it on your Instagram, does anyone know a makeup artist? Because I guarantee you, someone out there wants to do special effects makeup. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, the thing about makeup artists that I think we both learn is that a lot of their, their jobs are really boring, because they're doing makeup on an attractive model that's really boring, they want to do boring. Like special effects. Yeah, they want to do the fun. I know the reason why Jasmine was really excited for your project, Josh, I've never pitched her, I should have like, I've never done that, I've never done like a full body yeah. before. I want to sign on for this. So, you know, it's, it's enticing and with the creativity, giving them creativity to make something really new. I know like Rose Port, but we in the industry work working on, um, Jasmine signed on because she has really tight team running testing gets pulled out. So it's stuff like that that they like to do. Um, a lot of the time they, they would do it probably for maybe not, maybe not free, but they'll do it for next to nothing because it's something they want for their show reel. Mm. The more, the more expensive part will be the materials, really. That's what I always find. Like the materials for most of the budget. So the, the budget for the postman was about five hundred pounds, in the end. Which, considering it's a forty-minute movie, I thought was you know pretty good. And that's that's all out of my pocket, and um, I was more than happy to invest in myself. And that's the biggest advice I can give you guys: invest in yourself because no one's going to come over to you with a paycheck going right, make a movie. Invest in yourself, spend your money on, if you need equipment, spend your money on your own equipment or get out from the college, however you want to do it. Um, yeah. Literally, literally, use it because it's right there um, and you have this chance for the years you're here. So, like, literally abuse that chance as much as you can, exploit that and uh, take out as much equipment as you can and make, make the best movie you think possible and invest in yourself. So, if, whether that's actors' time, travel, um, accommodation, food, um, yeah, all the things you don't really think about. Get a producer as well, um, just to help manage it. Because at the end of the day, I, I'm a director, and the worst thing you want to be thinking about is, okay, right, where, where are they going to eat, where are they going to sleep? Get a producer to help you out, manage all that, so that way you can just focus on directing. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you're working on another project. Have you got any other upcoming projects? Yeah, so the big one right now is Emot for me. Uh, we just started the crowdfunding campaign, uh, literally yesterday. And uh, so it's a sci-fi uh, series, actually. So it's a, it's a pilot episode we're working on where emotions are prescribed and taking recreation as well. It's like the year 2070. So a big thing I took after the postman was, I was like, I want to work more on production design because a lot of the postman was just, oh, it's my granddad's house. Oh, look, it's my house. And uh, oh, I put a photo there. That's my production design done. I really wanted to, you know, explore how I had to build a set. And I think that's something I learned a lot from Elliot as well was we're doing roast pork, as we mentioned. And that's our first feature film as a company. And uh, it kind of, it's set in a kind of like a fantasy world. Yeah. And it's, it's showed me that it's possible to do something of that scale on a budget. And I, honestly, that, that was a massive inspiration for me to then go on to do like Emot and stuff like that. Because I wanted to make a sci-fi. Um, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. And wanted to kind of do my own spin on it. So yeah, we're doing a, a sci-fi series. Because I wanted to make a feature. But I didn't have, obviously I don't have the money just to make a completely uh, sci a complete feature film, sci-fi, all the sets, all the props done like that. So I've broken it down into about five episodes, starting off with a pilot to kind of pitch it to people and then build up kind of a cult following over the span of a few years, hopefully. And that way then I'm left with like a feature film that's a sci-fi. Yeah. Do you think it's better to try every role or just invest in one main role, like you want to? Um, well, it depends. It depends what well, some people just know exactly what they want to be like. Yeah, I want to be a makeup artist. Yeah, I want to be an actor. Um, as I said, I wanted to be an actor at first, and it took me. It was quite hard for me to admit that <coughs> that's not actually the route I want to go down. Um, yeah, I do recommend trying every role you can because you might find yourself really good at you know color grading, or you want. To, I want to be an editor. Um, and I think it's also good. Don't just stick to one crucial role because if you really want to network, make yourself as employable as possible. So me, I always market myself as I'm a writer, director, editor. They're the three things you can hire me for. And that's what I know I'm good at. But equally, when I came onto Elliot's set, I was like, well, I can, I can do sound. I've learned to do sound. I've learned to do this. Even though that's, I don't want to go through a career in sound, I've learned it. I've got that ticked off. 
Um, oh yeah, one of the key things I was going to add on to the end of that mm. is they definitely do at least something in every role because then as a director, you can communicate to your lighting engineer, your sound engineer, your cinematographer, and you know what you're talking about because you know how that role works. If I had a director who had no idea how sound works, like, yeah, I want this, and I'm like, I'll be annoyed because I'm like, that's not possible, and I've now got to explain mm. to you why that's not possible. So it's just that base level knowledge in every role, really, really important. Even if it's not something you maybe want to do, as you said, as mm. a full career, just having that knowledge is, is, is what's going to really, really help. And it's important because once you know it, it's, it's, you can exploit that and you can be more creative with it rather than just kind of nodding along going, yeah, I think I know what they're saying. Tell them what you want. And if you have a knowledge of it as well, even if they know more than you, at least if you have a little bit of knowledge, you can explain clearer what you want. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, um, just to kind of go back, like you say, me and Josh mainly do the directing, that's kind of our thing. Matt here is pretty much knows anything about equipment or technical stuff, and he's not that interested in directing or writing. So there isn't, if you don't want to be a director, that is absolutely fine, because he's all pretty much signed on for the next three years' worth of projects we're doing because of his technical skill and because he specialised in wanting to learn everything, mm. not just one thing. I hate audio. I will never get a job as an audio person ever. I do not invest my time in learning it. Matt has learned everything, and yeah, I mean, he's doing, he's the cinematographer for EMOC. Yeah. He's signed on for multiple projects just just because of his skill set and because he spent that time to learn every role. So, yeah, I would say the directing, directing or writing side is not really your view. I would say there's the trifecta of, I would say, kind of technical stuff in the film, and that's cinematography, sound, and lighting. Mm. Learning how it looks with a camera, how to light it, and how to record the audio. You get those three skills down, everywhere's going to want you because essentially you're a jack of all trades. You can fix any problem that's going to happen on set. And you can, if you can switch between those roles, you're going to be incredibly valuable to any production company. Also, no one wants, no one wants to do sound on set. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been doing it for like, oh my God, it's nine years now. It's not, I keep saying eight, it's nine years. And we've gone through so many sound people that no one wants to do sound. If you want to make money quick, buy sound equipment, and learn how to use it, mm. because no one wants to stand on set of a mic. That's how Matt started out working for <laughs> us. He's now our cinematographer and he's operating our cameras. No one wants to do sound. Yeah, just go off of that as well. Um, don't be intimidated by not being the best at that skill. I feel like the most important thing is, yeah, get, get a base knowledge, but the most important thing I look for is what are you going to bring to set personality-wise? How are you going to vibe with the rest of the crew? There's been so many crews where one person has stormed off or has disrupted it, and it just cr like disrupts the whole flow of the movie. It stops the film, and then it shows through the end result. Make it an easy-to-work-with environment. And I remember like, when I was first going up to work on Stab Alley, um, you know, I was going up against a couple of people, and there was someone who was you know, maybe more skilled in camera than me, but I didn't want to... Uh, they, I still got hired on because Elliot preferred work with me and I spoke more openly with him and it was an easier set environment to uh, work on. So don't let it all intimidate you. Just focus on what are you bringing to set and are you easy to work with? Yeah, you could be the best person. You could be the best like, filmmaker in the world. Mm. If you haven't asked that attitude, no one's going to want to work with you. There's a reason why Ben said I don't get any work anymore. <laughs> like, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, really, I'm correct. I think the person you're up against is way more qualified than you, but as you said, you were you're really easy to talk to, you've got them well with everyone, it's a positive atmosphere. When you're doing like nine hour shoot days, you've got to, you've got to be able to have a good time and a laugh, because otherwise you're just going to kill each other. Mm. Um, and yeah, that is, that is equally as important, just having a positive personality, as you said. Is anyone got a call? Yep. Is there a crucial lesson that you take from me on all of the future projects? Uh, from the postman or just... Um, from, the post, but from anything before the postman. Crucial lesson. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it's you. You make your own career. You don't. No one's going to come to you all the time. The chance of someone coming to you and be like, "Do you want to be on the next Martin Scorsese movie?" Are next to none. You know, make build your own career up. If you want to make a movie, if you're frustrated that you haven't been approached for anything, make your own set. Find the people who want to make their own sets. If you want to be a writer, there's so many different avenues you can go down. Write your own script, pitch it to people, because they might just be as passionate about it as you and want to make that film for you. So I feel like just make your own career and there's not one right or wrong way to get into the industry. It's everyone gets in, in different avenues. Yeah. I was going to say, when you're writing with 
like different characters. Yeah. Sorry, what the what are the important things? Um, when you're writing the different um, a tip I would always say is I always write a character profile. So the little details about each character. So um, when I wrote The Postman, I didn't know who was going to be a postman. I'd, I'd written the script already. I was like, Felix, he loses his daughter. It's all very sad. Um, and then I was like, but what does he do for a living? He's a single dad. How does he make money? Oh, I didn't know if, I, if he works in an office, then I have to rent, get a location and get him in an office place. And I came up with the postman to, because I was like, well, I can get a postman outfit. And he just goes door to door. And that's his job sorted. Everyone's like, oh, he's a postman. Um, and it, that small detail about him fleshes the character out a lot more. Um, I think also doing, just work out where you want your character to reach by the end of the movie before you start writing it. Where, what's the journey you want to take him on? Or, and yeah, I'd say that's the most important thing. What's his relationship? How does he talk with people? Get a voice for him as well. I was just also going to ask about like, writing dialogue. That hard. Um, yes, yeah, it can be. Especially because when you write it, you might not have an actor in mind. So sometimes when I write a script, I do have an actor in mind that I want for the role, but that could change. And people are going to say the lines differently. That's just how it is. Um, so writing dialogue, you could say a line about 10 times in your head and think, oh, that sounds fine. But when you say it out loud or hear someone else say it, you go, that's a bit cringy. You need to keep saying it, repeating it, rehearsals. That's the biggest thing as well, because it all comes out in rehearsals, really. Um, we, for Emot just now, last year I filmed five minutes of the proof of concept of Emot, and there's lines in that that through the proof of concept I was going to put in the final thing, and now I'm just watching it going that just doesn't it's not right for his character. So what's been brilliant is I've been able to go back and rewrite it, and it feels a lot more natural and a lot more fleshed out, and not as forced as it uh, did initially. Yep. For Emot, have you like worked out an area to build a set? Or yeah, so we're actually filming in a car park. So um, we basically got, uh, we had to talk to these neighbours to say, hey, can we use your uh, car parking space? There's no big deal, we're just going to make a sci-fi set on it. Um, and so we've got this like, kind of car park, which is brilliant, because it's got a roof over it, so weather's not going to be an issue. And um, essentially, we've got, we've got loads of pictures of it. We've already done the proof of concept, so we've got like, an initial idea of how we want the set to look. Um, I just had a meeting last week with my production des design team and they're drawing up like loads of concepts like, oh, we could put like a load of trash there. And Elliot gave a note the other week saying, oh, what if we had a puddle on the floor here? And just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, have wee stains on there. <laughs> From a cinematography perspective as well, water, great for the reflections, get some nice, interesting lights. And yeah. again, we've gone from having, right, how do I make a sci-fi set, have a team to bounce ideas off, or we could do that there, we could do that there. But now I, as a cinematographer, come in and go, right, this is really cool because I could potentially get some really nice angles and reflections with this set you've built. Mm. So it's collaborating with all the departments. Yeah, yeah. Talk to people. Because if we put if we put like a neon sign in there, that's then going to affect Gaffer. That's going to affect you. Yeah. How is that? How how is that going to change the mood of the scene? Yeah. Um, where are you getting that from? Or yeah. Battery run. What's the colour you're going for as well? Like, what's your set? What's your set theme? What what does each colour tell you? Good advice for everybody. This is just me speaking now. Red is the hardest colour to capture on film. If you have a, any scene and you're just going to think, oh, I'm just going to have a red light illuminating it, it's very tricky. You have to make sure you've got your camera settings just right. Otherwise, it's incredibly hard to capture detail, especially on faces. Mm. Blue is quite nice, though. Uh, green is some of the issue, but red is often the, uh, the most difficult. Yep. What's the bit that you, you watch in the postman and go, like, what's the bit you're least proud of? All of it. God, I'll never do that again. <laughs> um, my least favourite part, and it was no fault of really anyone, but it was the, the, the hitting of the car I mentioned earlier, obviously. Um, I got a whole other shot list of how I wanted to do it. And my little sister, as I said, was really scared of actually filming the scene. And I remember it was, it's, Ali had told me on set, like, never work with kids or, or animals. And because uh, it's very hard to control them and do them what they, you want to do. And um, I've, I, that scene, we had to then merge the five shots I wanted into just one continuous kind of shot and just kind of quickly rush to get the lines out there because, you know, we're losing daylight, we're losing time, we've got a shoot schedule to stick to. People are getting tired, people are getting hungry. And it just, it builds up the tension on set. There will be stressful days and you just got to kind of compromise. Um, if I was to redo it, I wish I had um, shown less to be honest with you. I wish I'd just had them walk along and, um, yeah, show the car, but 
kind of, I think you get the idea, like, you know, her, him creating the body, I think maybe just show the peace symbol bleeding. You don't, I think less is more sometimes, especially if you don't have the budget for it. Compromise, compromise, compromise. And you could find something better. Uh, I also think, you know, there's, yeah, there's just bits and bobs in the post that I definitely would have changed because I feel like it's a lot, you know, it was my first proper film. And I think from a writing point of view, it's kind of your first film, in my head, I was like, oh God, this is, this is my trauma. I want everyone to feel this. This is how sad, do you feel how sad this is? Do you feel it? And it's, it's like, people get the idea. And I think, you know, like Elliot said, the twist of mine was the torture scene at the end. And I think that's where I think the film really shines is as soon as Dan Wheeler's character comes into it, uh, as Ethan, as the therapist, it's, I think it picks up a lot because we have a lot more back and forth and we also have the torture scene at the end to kind of get people out of their seats. Um, so yeah, the first 10 minutes is probably what I would change the most. Yeah. How, how did you get uh, original composed? Uh, oh yeah, that honestly was just blind luck. And so um, it was this guy called JJ uh, Neil who did The Postman. And uh, honestly, I'd never worked with a composer before, ever. All of my films up until that point, like short films when I used to do like little YouTube videos were like two minutes long. And I'd just type in sad, non-copyrighted music, download. And then that was, that was my movie done, sorted, call it a day. But if you have a composer, what was incredible was he can read the script and then do it to the script. He can get a much more, a better feel for the movie of what you're going for is exact. Because every, anything you find online, it would just be, you know, it's just random people. Not, they don't see your film. And it's, uh, yeah, he, he messaged me though. He wanted to do it for his own uh, final project. So he, I was looking for a composer and he said, oh Josh, I really need to do a film. Are you doing a film right now? I was like, I am doing a film, that's brilliant. And he was like, brilliant, you're helping me out. So it was almost like we were doing each other a favor here. So again, you, I don't know at college if there's anyone doing music at college or anything like that, but yeah, I'm sure there'll be some people in the music department who wants to compose for movies. I don't know if that's what they do. Expand on that quick situation. So you were contacted by a composer who was really eager to work on it. Yeah. And he knew you were doing your film. Again, I, I posted about it. I was constantly posting about it. I was constantly telling people, word of mouth, because uh, I was at college. He was at college with me. And word of mouth, they were like, oh, jo Josh is doing a film, so he called me. Uh, he also knew, because we went to secondary school together as well, I was always the kid who was doing this two minute short films and just making, you know, my students was like, Josh, I'm not an actor, well you are today. And just making them do all these little two minute shorts and it, d yeah, and it's so a word of mouth, so he knew of my reputation for making movies. So he was like, I'll ask Josh, see what he's working on right now. Um, um, but yeah, uh, the, I've, got, I've recently got a new composer actually for Emot. Uh, his name's Liam, and his bizarre story how I met him was I was literally just on set, on a different set, and we we're filming at this cafe, and we were just outside the cafe in high visits, and he just came up to us and was like, guys, look, I'm a composer, I've finished uni, I need some work, is anyone making a movie? And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. And I just got his details. I showed him my work. He was like, brilliant, can I work for you? I was like, absolutely. Uh, let's give you a go. Let's see what music you can do. Let's see what you can actually produce. Because anyone can say, I want to do it, but are they actually <laughs> going to vibe with your movie? How, are they going to produce the music you want? Because that's the hardest thing for me to explain to someone is music. I can explain how, where I want the shot. I can explain what I want from an actor, the pitch I want. But when it comes to music, I always find that's quite hard because it's like, well, I wanted them to go da, 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 like that. And it just doesn't make sense. And they're like, how do you want to do that? Um, talk to your composer, tell them the tone of the scene, explain when the moments you want to hit, let them read the script and then study the script, sit down together and maybe do some like Zoom calls and just see what they come up with. A key thing when you take away with that is make yourself visible. Is that social media, that's it, kind of, you know, any kind of social networking. If you go to university, there's going to be loads of different groups and events going on. Make yourself visible because then people may literally come to you. So, like, oh, I heard you're doing this. Is there anything I can get involved with? That's one of the key messages. Mm. So even if you think, a big bit of advice I want to say is don't just make a huge film, not mention to anybody, and then just post it somewhere. Because mm. no one's going to see it. It's going to get lost at the bottom of YouTube somewhere. Advertise the whole process. Show, oh, we're doing this, this is behind the scenes on set, day two. And then some people are going to start engaging in that process and then be hyped for the final reveal. And then it's almost like guaranteed viewership. And then that goes, you know, word of mouth. And that's how you network. And it's like with the breakdown you just watched, I made that a few years later, but I had all the footage left over to make the kind of like documentary kind of style. Um, I didn't release the postman until a few years after that, until I had a good platform to properly, well, I knew it was going to be the most seen. 
and we built it up for about two months, just going like, here's, here's some photos of the postman, or here's a teaser trailer, um, here's an interview of one of the actors maybe, or uh, here's the original score of the post, because then you're marketing again, you're composer, and it's everyone's getting recognition, and like even this right now, you know, I can use part of this to be like, right, we spoke about Emot here, or we had a, we had a chat about the postman here, and it's you're constantly just talking about. It. Don't let the film be the only way to find you. Have posters, have, have uh, screen, sh screen grabs of the film and uh, interviews with the actors because it's going to help everyone around it and it's just going to build up this cult following so when it comes out, everyone's hyped and they finally get to see it. Mm. Last, last question, we're going to have to talk Yep. What was one of the most stressful times in college or uni that you had to overcome? Oh, God. Um, at college, yeah, as I said, it was, it was a weird time for me because uh, I was just, you know, I, I was a bit worried that I was doing it wrong. That, that's what I was most scared of. I was like, I'm, I'm not making the films I want to make. I kind of felt like my um, passion was kind of like dwindling a little bit. And I, I kind of stopped. I was really self-doubting my self-worth. And I made The Postman initially. As I said, I didn't make it for my final project. I made it to prove to myself that I can still do this, that I want to do this. And I remember because I went for like a year in 2020 without making really anything. And... Um, it was obviously other than Tractor Run. Um, but it wasn't until you know, I started doing that again, it was like, oh, yeah, this is, I feel at home here. I, this is what I want to be doing. Because I kind of felt myself kind of getting a bit lazy, lying back a little bit during college. And it, it, I had to kind of get off my arse and kind of just start, just write a script. And you could be going, oh, yeah, I, I, I really want to write a script. I just, I, the, pa the first paragraph just doesn't get, I just can't get it right. Write whatever you've got down on your head. So just make a start. Write the end. If you've got the ending, write the ending. You, you, might, you might throw it away or you might use it later. Um, yeah, I think the biggest hurdle was just kind of getting off my house and just doing it. And I, as I said, you, you're the own, you make your own career. There's not one way to get into this. Um, if you think you can make a really good 10-minute film, please go and do that because you know, you're hurting no one but yourself in that scenario if you don't make it.